Of course, this is, this is an outrageous story. One of our former students went up to Washington and wanted to start a ministry. And uh, in this uh, ministry, they sought to get approval from the county. So it's actually listed on the county list of, uh, of things that they offer. And, uh, and it's, they actually have been given badges so that the ministry people can go behind police lines if there's an accident and a fatality, they can go. Because the name of the team is the, the DRT team, the dead raising team. Come on, the dead raising team. The county lists their services. This is what we provide. And we include the dead raising team. Amazing. And so the mortuary has their business cards. That if you have a loved one you'd like to get back, we provide this service. We have a dead raising team. And they've had one resurrection already. Come on. Somebody drowned, pulled him up on the beach, tried all the stuff, couldn't resuscitate him, so they called the wagon to come and pick up the body. And one of the dead raising team members was there. DRT. You die, we pray. <laughs> she went over, began to pray in the spirit over, over this gentleman that, that had died. And a little while later, he just sat up. And there's a crowd all around him. And he goes, what's going on here? The DRT. We need badges. Come on, we need badges. <laughs> you know, you have not because you ask not. Somebody thought of it and pursued it, and the county said, well, yeah, why not? Let's <laughs> that is too cool. be amazing to live in a place where there's so many people that are raised from the dead that you have to leave a notice with your family. If I die, leave me alone. <laughs> I want to stay there. <laughs> All right. I want to talk to you today about a uh, fascinating subject uh, for me. I, I felt the Lord speak to me actually this week. Let me tell you about the week first, and I'll tell you what the word was. I was in Toronto this week. Again, uh, I was there a couple weeks ago. And I got to speak at their uh, Partners in Harvest, which is the name of their network, Partners in Harvest Conference. So I met with their, uh, many of their pastors uh, that came in from all over the world. And uh, it was a great time. Uh, John and Carol are going to be with us this week at our conference. So that's it's like heaven on earth right there to have those guys come and, uh, and be with us again. And uh, so we're going to have uh, just a whole bunch of, of fun with these these guys, I don't know, I don't think I've ever met anyone in my life that is a better steward of revival, a steward of what God has released. Uh, they, they just amaze me, impress me so much. And so I'm just happy, happy camper to have them come back to the house this week. Um, so anyway, I was there, and while I was there, um, one of the things that John uh, asked me to do is that if he and I together could talk to the pastors about the situation with Todd Bentley. And um, while I'm not going to deal directly with that issue today, we'll be putting a statement on our website here real soon, uh, once again, just to let people know of progress. It's not my subject matter. I'm just letting you know my background of the week that kind of sponsored some areas of thought and concern and prayer and eventually the, uh, this word from the Lord. Um, I went from there to, uh, actually, I, I flew home. I got up at like a quarter to one in the morning, our time, quarter to four Toronto time and caught a plane to get back to Reading and got here about I think 11:30 and uh, went home and changed suitcases, put some clean clothes in a bag and and uh, caught a flight at 2:30 to go to Bakersfield. 
and uh, was there for a couple of nights. And there are some dear, dear friends of this house that uh, are in Bakersfield. And there's a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit in that city. It uh, is so encouraging to me. I've heard about it for a year. I know some of the people involved. And uh, to go there and to witness and to see what God was doing was a real treat for me. But one of the reasons um, I was asked to come is because um, there was a, a man, a friend of mine, a man that I've known for a number of years. In fact, I've ministered in his church. Uh, about a year ago, he went to Bakersfield, and the power of God just fell on this thing, and there was extended meetings, and they've had these extended meetings now for a year. But they went on night after night. I don't remember how many nights a week. I think it was five or six, maybe even seven nights a week for quite a long period of time. And there was such a presence and such power. And after uh, a couple months into this, it was uh, discovered that this man had a secret life. And he had uh, immoral, not, yeah, a secret, not a good secret life, uh, an, an immoral lifestyle. And um, so I, when I heard about it, of course, I heard about it from them in Bakersfield and then also those who are working with the individual to get him restored. And from the person himself, a, a friend of mine who wrote and uh, was extremely repentant and they're on course to have their whole household family really, really healed. It's, that's going well, but that's not my subject this morning. <clears throat> the subject, um, uh, anyway, I, so I, I wrote a letter to the church in Bakersfield. I wrote a letter to... Uh, this particular pastor, David Go, and to his congregation that they uh, have been given a privilege to receive something that God released into the earth and for them to pastor it well. And that because the instrument that was used to bring uh, this tremendous release uh, into their city, because he is a, a fallen brother, that they're to really guard what God released them and not take that as an opportunity to shut things down, but instead they need to intensify. And anyway, he read it to his church, passed it around the city, and they asked specifically if I would come to minister to the church, because they're obviously, there are people that have been, uh, they're so, uh, such a great group of people, so hungry for God. They have so much great things that are going on in their city. It's one of the most unified, unified cities I've seen of leaders that work together. It's really impressive. We had, I met with leaders in an afternoon session and had people from so many different churches. And it's just really fun to see that kind of devotion to one another. Uh, these people actually like each other. It's like, it's like they're required to love each other, but they're not required to like each other. And these guys like each other, so it's pretty cool. So um, anyway, so I, I, uh, I, I went down and met, met with uh, this group and ministered there. Primarily, I wanted to go to be an encouragement to them. But in, this week has been a process in this theme. And so I'm going to kind of spill over a bit and tell you what I, I feel like the Lord has been speaking. While I was in Toronto, the Lord spoke to me. And he said um, that he has hidden some of the great truths about the anointing in the most offensive stories in Scripture. In the places we would be least likely to study or to look, he has hidden things there. And immediately that started a chain of thought um, because I remember, I remember Randy Clark, he's made this story public probably a thousand times if he's done it once, has talked about when the Lord touched him so powerfully. If, you, if you're not familiar, there's been an outpouring of the Spirit in Toronto since January 20th of 1904. Excuse me, 1994. That's, that's a real outpouring right there. 1994, January 20th. So they're coming up on their 15th, 15 year anniversary. Randy Clark was the man of God that was used to bring a tremendous release of revival outpouring. And, uh, but Randy, a few months earlier, was just dry and dying. And a friend of his called him like close to the middle of the night and said, man, I've been, uh, God is moving again. And he was so excited. And Randy was just, you know, he was wanting to go anywhere he could go to get touched by God. And Randy is, is a brilliant man. He is, uh, I call him an apologist. He is just, uh, he's so well studied and it's sanctified intelligence. He's just really brilliant. And um, he uh, has a tremendous value for the whole body of Christ. But at this particular time, in his life, he had a value for everyone except for one group. 
And, uh, and the Lord, as he knows how to do it, caused the great outpouring of the Spirit to actually happen with the one group he didn't want to associate with. And what I've noticed through the years is that um, the Lord will often put the thing you're hungriest for close to the group of people you don't want to be associated with to see if you'll pray to Christ to get what you, what you need to get. Because what happens frequently is there is this idea uh, people um, try to protect themselves from being labeled. Uh, does this make sense to you? Um, uh, if In Randy's case, uh, not wanting to be associated with this particular group, and it's called Word of Faith. Now, today, uh, he does healing schools all over the world, and one of the primary speakers is a Word of Faith uh, author and pastor, a very dear friend, because since then, uh, some of the misconceptions that Randy had about the movement uh, have been clarified. Um, but here's what we tend to do as, as teachers, pastors, etc., is that if we start to teach on a subject that seems to be close to another movement that maybe went awry, there's, there's all of these dis disclaimers giving. I'm going to talk to you about deliverance, but I'm not part of that group over there. Uh, I'm going to talk about faith, but I, I'm not one of those. And because there's this fear of being labeled or associated with a different group, and somehow we have to get over that issue because some of what you need, you'll only get if you get labeled. Some of what you're hungry for, you only get at the risk of being labeled. Labeled, uh, I, I teach certain things and, uh, uh, concerning the kingdom that remind some of the hearers of other movements that went awry. Yeah. And so what they do is the way they can disqualify whatever I'm speaking is to put a label over me that I'm, well, you're, you're one of those. And that somehow they disengage the word that is true from their need because they were able to put a label. And it's not them, it's you and me. And the temptation to try to find our own identity and, uh, and, and uh, at, at the risk of, of unintentionally bringing dishonor to parts of the body of Christ is just, is just a, a really big deal right now. All right. So here the Lord has these truths for us to learn about his anointing. But he has hidden these things in some of the stories that are the most difficult to wade through. Because what we tend to do, like has happened in Lakeland, so many people uh, thought it was a great move of God, and then Todd fell. And so the, uh, the attempt by media and Christian leaders is to say, well, this only goes to prove that this wasn't really a move of God. As though God needed somebody who was perfect to flow through. Yeah, like you and me. Yeah, people who have no issues whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and so the Lord has released so much into the earth, sometimes through intentionally unclean people. For example, one of the most significant prophecies in the New Testament came from a man named Caiaphas. He was the high priest. He was anti-Christ. Anti-Christ. He opposed Jesus, had purposed and planned to crucify Jesus. And yet in John 11, you find him speaking, releasing a word. Remember, words create realities. Releasing a word into the earth. He said, it is not that a man should die for the nation only, but that all the people of God would be gathered in, together into one. And he prophesied this word about the purpose behind Christ's death, is that his death would make true unity possible. He prophesied it. Because God can speak through ungodly people, he can work through donkeys. He can speak through the Old Testament has a donkey preaching. So that's, that, that would sober me right up right there. That would, that would just about do me in getting a donkey talking. I've seen close to that. <laughs> pull out, Bill. Pull out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've been close to that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to recover here, and I'm not getting any help from the front row. There's this, 
Yeah, now I'll go to this side over here. It's a much more sanctified group on this side. Right <laughs> now, so many, they, you know, they, if they teach on faith, they have to give a disclaimer because they don't want to be considered word of faith. I'd rather be considered word of faith than word of unbelief, which really should be the title of some churches. Let's drink to that one. Right? <laughs> the guy we're going to look at, I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 1. One of the most respected men in Scripture in all of history is King David. We're going to look at his life for a, just a moment, actually, because he's going to take us somewhere else. And the reason I thought we should look to his life is I think David is probably the one who was the most familiar, uh, certainly in the Old Testament, and, and for most of even the New Testament, he was the most familiar with the presence of God. Now, we commonly state, proclaim, confess, that our greatest value is with the presence of God is that the Holy Spirit is our greatest treasure. What we value most is him. And David is one of these men who, who spent more time in the actual manifested presence of God than uh, probably anybody else in certainly Old Testament times. Because the glory of God would be manifest on Mount Zion. David would go in for hours and spend that time just in the presence of his glory ministering to the Lord. He was a man who knew the value of anointing. He knew the value of the presence of God on a person's life. And what I want to do is we're going to use this as kind of a jumping off point. Um, Saul was king before David. And Saul was a man who started well, but he ended so poorly. And it's really a bummer as you look through history. You know, if, you, um, if you've read anything about John Alexander Dowie, Many consider him to be the father of the healing revival that started at the end of the 1800s into the 1900s. He was a man who, I mean, the guy was arrested a hundred times in one year because of his boldness in preaching the gospel. Um, he, uh, he would be, you know, jailed for practicing medicine without a license, you know, because he would pray for the sick and they'd get healed. He started healing homes, uh, the healing rooms that we hear of with John G. Lake, John G. Lake, one of my personal heroes, received impartation from Dowie. So Dowie is really considered the father of this thing. And he had healing homes where he had in, uh, I, I don't remember if the number was 5,000 or 6,000, so we'll just say 5,000 to be safe. In a short period of time, he had all these homes where the dying would come and they would live. And they would receive personal prayer and ministry and teaching for days on end. And, uh, and in the years that they had these homes, the last we could find, the last record we could find is they had over 5,000 people healed and only five or six, six had died. 5,000, in three years, 5,000, thanks, Denny, 5,000 were healed and only six had died in a three-year period of time. Now, these are people that are dying, but they would come in to this, into the, what these folks had tapped into. Dowie, tremendous man of God, ended very strange. And what has happened throughout history is people read the story and they see, well, it ended strange. William Branham, if I mention the name William Branham in certain circles, I mean, they almost want to, you know, stone me because William Branham is known for the heresy towards the end of his life. And yet there are few men that have ever lived and perhaps no one that has ever lived carried the anointing and the power that this particular man had. So here's the deal. The Lord doesn't give us the option of pursuing character or power. That is not a legal option. For those, I, I remember hearing, uh, you know, speakers would say that if we have to choose character or power, we have to choose character. That's not a legal choice. They're two sides of the same coin. When we see someone who moves in miracle signs and wonders and they have a, a horrible lifestyle, they have an offense of a sin-filled lifestyle, that does not get us off the hook from pursuing a lifestyle of power. 
What it does is it's to add the sobering element that my passion for power has to be equaled by my passion for all the systems that God has created in his word for me to walk in purity. There must be equal pursuit, passion, emphasis in my own inward life on this aspect of life or this thing that is so noticeable by everybody, the power, you start re reading your own press reports and you start, you're, you start believing that you can get away with things because you have such favor and such power, such anointing. And it's happened all throughout history. The point is, is that we're not off the hook because somebody fell pursuing this. I'm now required to walk sober-minded after the very thing God has called me into, realizing that the backbone of all of it is supposed to be a pure heart a lifestyle of integrity, a lifestyle of a character. David, one more thing. We've heard for years, we've taught, we've practiced, uh, every once in a while the Lord will bring up again the subject of dealing with offense. Somebody's offended us. And the easiest stuff to recognize is when somebody hurts you, they hurt your feelings, they lie to you, they steal, they... Uh, you know, speak uh, uh, poorly to you. They dishonor you, whatever it might be, where they violate you in some way. To, f to live without offense is just a big deal. We've been learning about this for years, and every once in a while, the Lord will bring yet another guest in who will speak to us, because it's such a big deal for where are we going. We have to go there clean, and going there clean means that we live without the spirit of offense. But recognizing when I'm hurt and I'm bitter or angry at somebody because they've hurt me is much easier to recognize than when I am offended at their immoral lifestyle and my passion for holiness has actually shielded the real issue of the heart, which is my resentment for the, towards them because they have failed. Anger and resentment often masquerades right now across this land Anger and resentment is masquerading as a passion for holiness. And people are washing them, their hands as fast as they can so that they have no association with that fallen individual. Somehow wanting to cleanse their lame, name from any kind of association or that they knew them or, or whatever. There's just this this frantic thing to appear clean when Jesus did everything but that. Everything but that. He was called a, a glutton and a drunk because he, he was with those people constantly. It was, it was the association. He didn't concern himself with the association. He concerned himself with purity of heart and mind and a lifestyle of power. Those two things together transform society. And it's not one or the other. Both are working together in tandem. And so now we're to the story of David. And David is the man that knows about the presence and I want you to look at this verse. Saul, excuse me, I, I need to set it up a little better. Saul is the king who ended bad. How did he end bad? He ended so bad that he ended up consulting mediums. Here's a guy that God spoke to directly. The anointing came upon him. He, he consulted mediums. He, did, he, did, he absolutely violated the direction, the word of the Lord in his life. And he ended so poorly that he was a tormented, demonized man that when David would play the harp, the demons would be driven from him because they couldn't stand in the presence of that anointing. But when David would leave, that torment would come back. And finally Saul chased him and kicked him out of his house and tried to kill him and chased him for 10 to 13 years. So here's a guy that David has every reason in the world to despise. Because David has now been called the anointed one. It's recognized that Saul, the Spirit of God, left Saul, and he's just this tormented figure. At one point, uh, two times, David had a chance to take Saul's life. At one point, he went into a cave where Saul was sleeping, and his men prophesied to him, said, the Lord has delivered him into your hand. And he went and he cut a corner of, David, of Saul's robe off, and then stood on the other side of, of the ravine, and he was so convicted for what he had done because he had blemished the appearance of his king. He had tarnished his image. 
And yet his own men were reminding him of the word over his life that he was to be king, and God has turned Saul into his hand. And yet David, he, David demonstrated such a devotion and a loyalty to this man that he, he literally repented one-on-one -on -one to Saul. He woke him up in the cave and stood and talked to him and said, look, I, I, I cut I cut the corner of your robe off. And there was this act of repentance, and Saul stood there dumbfounded by the integrity of this man, David, and he says, you're, you're a greater man than I am. So here's this King David. Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle. And this chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, verse 17, says, David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan and told them Teach the children of Judah the song of the bow, the song that he had written. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. We're only going to take one verse here, verse 19. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Now, here's the challenge. David is not only singing a song. He's not living in denial. He doesn't forget the fact that Saul was a tormented man. But he did one of the most difficult things to do in life is he maintained a perspective on Saul as he chose to sing songs and to declare and to talk about Saul as he remembered him when he functioned under the anointing. You know, here's the guy who knows about the presence. And what is he doing? He's pointing somewhere. He's pointing. He's pointing to a place in history, a man, a man named Saul, who had an experience in God that if we can get over the issue of being offended by somebody who ended poorly. See, David, we celebrate because he ended well. We have Psalms 51. He repented fully before the Lord of his sin, and he, he ended well. He ended clean, pure. Saul did not. He did not repent. There's no record of his repentance. And so when we tend to despise that kind of sin, which we rightly need to despise, we tend to throw out the very thing that, that was from God in the first place, from this man's life. Here's the temptation for, uh, for me and, and, and others. is I, I know of a particular case, one of the great miracles I've seen is a, a man that was healed of cancer right before my eyes. The tumors literally just disappeared. Sometime later, the cancer came back. So the temptation is to not show the story of what God did. <laughs> what did God do? He healed him of cancer. Just because there were issues in life that didn't get taken care of, just because there was another assault and cancer came back in his life, does not prevent me from sharing the good news of what I saw God do. Are, are you guys getting this? Do, do you see that sometimes... Issues that go on in, in, our, in the religious mind disqualify from us celebrating what God has done. This is what's going on right now. People are deciding, uh, it's interesting, John, uh, he was asked the question, what do we do with Todd's books and, and uh, the product that we have from him? So we sell them. They're written under the anointing. They're still good. You know, it's, it's like we, we have to somehow... We somehow have to love a person in sin, embrace what took place in the anointing. Here's a new element here. Embrace what was done by God's hand on life without embracing sin or lifestyle. And somehow those three things have to be held in tension. So what does David do? David is singing a song about a guy who ended poorly. Now, Solomon there's no record, that, at least that, that, I, that I've been able to recognize, of Solomon ending well, but we still read Proverbs. Yeah. Song of Solomon, we still go through. Ecclesiastes, even. <laughs> and a few of the Psalms that are at the end of the Psalms that Solomon wrote. The point is, is that what we're willing to do for somebody in history, we have to be willing to do for somebody who lives now. We, it's religious 
It's what, the, it's, what the scribe, it's what the Pharisees dealt with, is that they could honor the prophets that were dead, but they struggled with the prophets that were alive. And oftentimes, religion allows you to embrace a standard where it doesn't have any sharp edge any longer. It's just a concept from the past. It's easier to embrace that from history than it is when, it's, when we're, history is being written right now and the end of the story has not yet been worked out. I tell you, if some of the fallen ones get fully restored and are preaching the gospel again, many of those who are criticizing them right now will be back in the audience praising them for what they're doing. But who's going to stay with them in midterm? Who's going to stay with them throughout the process? Who is going to be able to applaud the anointing that came upon them? See, here's the deal. You can't tell me you're hungry and have me give you a chicken and say, I'm not going to eat it because there's bones in it. Learn to eat meat throughout the bones. If you're really hungry, eat meat. You don't have to eat the bones. Don't eat the inedible things. There's certain things that God has released through individuals in life. And all of us, let's just be really honest, all of us, our ministry is meat and bones. I wish I could say I had it all together. I'm totally ignorant of delivering bones to you, but you're required to spit them out. If you start gagging, All right, where is David pointing? He's pointing to Saul's life. So let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Actually, we'll read a couple of verses out of chapter 9 first. David, the man who recognized the anointing. Does this make sense to you? That he is valuing the memory of a man who functioned in the anointing, empowered by the Spirit of God, and when he writes a song, he doesn't write it about his failure. He writes it about what he was at his high point in God. That's a stunning thing to do for a guy who ended poorly. Now, in 1 Samuel 9, um, Saul is a young man. He's not king yet. And uh, he's out hunting for his dad's donkeys. Somehow the donkeys got loosed, and he was gone for several days looking for dad's donkeys. And, uh, and he had this great idea. Let's go to the prophet. Let's go to the seer in verse 18. He'll tell us. So... Verse 19 of 1 Samuel 9, Samuel answered Saul, said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that's in your heart. How many of you, at least it used to be, that whenever you heard there was a prophet around, the last thing you wanted to hear from the prophet was have him tell you all that was in your heart? The last, I mean, I would, I would confess sins I never did just to clear all the bases before I... <laughs> you know, the whole image of the prophet reading your heart, you know, all that's in your heart is, is this disclosing of all this corruption that you're not aware of, you know. And that wasn't at all. This is such a great picture of grace that the prophet says, listen, I'm going to define your destiny for you. You've got stuff hidden in your heart. It's there embryonically. I'm going to call it to the surface because the significance of your life is about to be exposed and birthed. Tremendous bent. And Chris has really done a tremendous job of modeling this as the focus. And that's why we have such safe prophetic teams here. Um, verse uh, 19 says, I'll tell you all that's in your heart. Verse 20, but as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, don't be anxious for them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and all your father's house? Now, what he just did, this is important to realize. I would like to emphasize a, a verse here, a concept. The church, we, we, tend to, we tend to go out and try to answer questions that people aren't asking. They're not, if they're not asking about eternity, then, then, you don't, then the answer isn't for their eternal soul. You say, well, that's the most important thing. It's true. But I want you to notice that Samuel first answered the question of Saul's heart, which, made, which was, where are the donkeys? He answered the question of his heart so he would be positioned to bring him into his destiny. Good, the world is asking questions of us 
They want to know how can they have a good, healthy family. They want to know how is it that business can succeed in this day and age? How is it possible that these areas of trauma and difficulty throughout life, is it possible to weather these kinds of storms and to make it? Is it possible that there could be a cure for this disease or for this issue or that problem? And they're asking these questions right and left, and the church is out there. We're out there saying, you have to repent to go to heaven. You need to be cleansed from your sin. And they're not even conscious that they're sinners. And so if we bring a message that doesn't satisfy the question, even though it is the priority message, it's the eternal, it's the word of the Lord. Let's be honest. What, of what eternal significance is the word, your donkeys have been found? It's just, there's no, it has no eternal significance, but it was the question of the heart. So when he addressed the question of the heart, what happened is suddenly there was a bridge for him to now speak the word of the Lord that would affect his destiny. We have to learn how to find the answers, the solutions, to be able to serve people for where they're crying, for where they're hurting, for what's going on in their heart and mind, the questions that they have. I have a friend of mine that whenever he's asked a question, if he doesn't know the answer, he just tells them, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find it. And then he'll call him back, and he'll just search. He'll pray, he'll study, he'll do whatever it takes, but he says, I'll find the answer. And then he gets before God, and he gets the answer. It's a tremendous way. Does this make sense to you? Tremendous way to make an adjustment now, all right? So here we, we have uh, uh, Saul, uh, and he's called the one on whom all, is all the desire of Israel. Now go to verse 1 of chapter 10. Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Stunning declaration that God just made Saul the commander over God's own inheritance, which is his people. I got good news for you. You are what God inherits out of all of this. This is confirmed in Ephesians that you are the inheritance of the Lord. All right, so let's jump over to verse 5. You guys doing all right? Everybody's doing all right. Okay, you got to work hard to follow here. Um, I need need you to work with me this morning. Verse 5, after that you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you shall prophesy with them and be turned into another man." And it shall be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion commands or demands because God is with you. Now, here's the deal about the anointing. There's several things about the anointing that I want you to to see. The anointing they took um, for Aaron and his sons. They were the priesthood ministry in Old Testament. What they did is is they took blood and they took oil. Now, what does the blood do, the blood of Jesus do? It deals with what? It deals with sin, all right? So they took the blood of animals. This is before Jesus because it gave temporary postponement, but it gave a prophetic picture of what was coming. So they took blood, and they sprinkled it on Aaron and his sons. And then they took oil. What does the oil represent? The Holy Spirit, the anointing, okay? They took oil, and they sprinkled that on the uh, priest. Now, the Bible says that we are qualified by the anointing. So think about this. The blood deals deals with sin, but what the blood does in your life and my life, the blood of Jesus that cleanses from sin, it brings me out of the red, out of debt. But it's the anointing that takes you into the black. Does that make sense? Both were needed because, because being without sin now doesn't qualify me. What qualifies us for ministry? It's the anointing. The anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit that rests upon another, enabling them to do God-like actions. The anointing of the Spirit releases a grace where there's a divine ability to function with as you give your testimony. There is a power that you can't muster up, but that power is released and a life is changed. 
as you pray for the sick person in the grocery line and that deaf ear is open, it wasn't because of your significance in and of yourself. It's because you were taken out of the red by the black, by the blood, and into the black by the anointing. You were given substance of heaven to administer and to distribute. That's what the anointing does. So here we have Saul. Now remember, David's pointing to this man. And this is what I felt the Lord speak to my heart this week. He said, I have hidden some of the truths in the stories where it would be the easiest for you to brush off because the person ended poorly. And so this is what I'm wanting to do personally. I'm personally wanting to say, all right, what is it that happened to Saul? First of all, we have uh, 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 verse 7 says, and let it be when, you, uh, when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands. Jump down to verse 9, and then let me talk to you. So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. Here's the deal. He's talking with Saul, uh, Samuel one-on-one, -on -one, and Samuel said, listen, you're going to meet these prophets. They've got all these musical instruments, and uh, when you get there, you're supposed to prophesy with them. And so Saul says, Okay, you can imagine he's a young man, he's scared to death. He says, okay, as soon as he turns his back to walk away, the Bible says God gave him a new heart. What you've got to see is this anointing that was being released on him. Samuel just took that flask of oil, poured it over his head, prophesied his destiny. That anointing has now qualified him to be successful in his assignment. God has just linked him with a spirit of success with an anointing that knows how to get things done. So he turns, he's still in a place of, uh, of, of not being capable. He turns, and as he turns, the Bible says, God gave him a new heart. It's before he even met up with the prophets. So now he leaves Samuel's presence, and that day he runs, he goes up the hill, sees the prophets coming down with the instruments. He's with them, they start prophesying, he stands in their anointing, and he begins to prophesy, and the Bible says, all right, it's not just a new heart now, it says, when he stood with these prophets and prophesied, God changed him into another man. Into another man. Years ago, I, I, there was a situation where we had to bring correction on somebody. And so I restricted them from ministry, and I did so for a, a period of time. I don't remember. Let's just say it was six months. I wanted to pull them back because there were some deep, deep issues of the heart that had to be taken care of. And I pulled them out of ministry, and I, I monitored this situation myself. And one day, this verse hit me, and I realized that, that when somebody is, is, there may be seasons where we have to pull people out of ministry, so I don't want to blacklist that concept, all right? But as I was looking at the situation, I realized I'm keeping this man from where he is anointed. And where he is anointed is what will give him the opportunity to succeed. Does that make sense? As Saul was prophesying, that's when he was turned into another man. And because we're so afraid of, uh, of, approve, of appearing to, we don't approve sin lifestyles. So the, the fear isn't approving sin lifestyle. I have no fear of approving a sinful lifestyle. It's, it's so not a value in me to value sin that I, I don't struggle with that. What I struggle with is the appearance to you that this action to you would look like I approve a sin lifestyle. Yeah. And so by, by having that fear, that concern, it's a legitimate concern, it's not a legitimate fear. That... When it turns into a fear thing, then what I do is I start living, anticipating your reaction instead of living according to what is true. And with this guy, I, I had to meet with him. I said, I'm not to restrict you from ministry any longer. His term wasn't over. And I had to put him right back into doing something monitored, safe, where we talk, we would meet. But I had to put him back in the place where he'd experienced the anointing coming upon his life so that as the anointing came upon him, he would have the opportunity that God gave to Saul, which was what? I have turned you into another man. You now have all the equipment necessary to carry out my commission and to do it well. So the fact that Saul fell into sin consulting a medium, involved in the witchcraft, doing the stuff that he did, the rebellion, the times of not listening to God, not listening to his voice, ignoring his commands, all of that took place was a deliberate choice of Saul because all the equipment was put in place for him to succeed. 
Are you getting this? The anointing on your life is what positions us to be victorious in character. That's the point. The anointing for power is what positions a person to be victorious. It's not mandated. It's not automatic. The Lord, why would the Lord use somebody that had a secret lifestyle of immorality? Because the Lord honors his word. We don't understand how much he values his word. We don't have a concept of how what God has said is so treasured in heaven. He honors it above his name. Isn't that what the scripture says? Stunning. I don't understand that at all. Not at all. And I know now that by saying that, I'll get emails that will explain it to me, which I appreciate. <laughs> Sorry, I lost track of the anointing. Okay. The Lord honors his word. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good point all by itself. I was going to say something else, but I think that'll do. I think that'll just kind of settle. It's the reason you can have people who don't even know the Lord and they can obey biblical principles and they can come into success in life. Why? Because God honors his word. It, we are being held accountable by God to treasure what he releases into the earth even if it's through a blemished and imperfect vessel. Right now there are many trying to wash their hands of Lakeland instead of realizing that there are fires of revival all over the world because of what took place there. And the fact that it could happen through a blemished vessel, vessel should encourage us. It's never to condone sin, but it should bring us tremendous encouragement. We are being held accountable. Now, Honestly, as a church, this is like preaching to the choir, as they say, because you guys, from what I've seen through the years, at any expense, just value the move of God no matter how and when and where and what all. So I really give honor to you for that. But across the board, around the body of Christ, the church is going to be held accountable for what was released. And the encouraging thing to me is my recent visit in Bakersfield just got back um, in the wee hours yesterday was I found a group of leaders that responded to the challenge to eat the meat and throw out the bones, to embrace what God was doing, to celebrate the move of God, even though to them it's an embarrassment or could be an embarrassment that it was released through a man who was living with secret sin. Can we do that without endorsing the secret sin? Can we do that? Can we celebrate a move of God without condoning a lifestyle of hidden sin? We must. Now I have a question for Well, wait, one more thing. It says here in verse 7, it says, When these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. Here's a really important part of life and ministry for us is the anointing qualifies you to do as the occasion demands. Here's what happens. Is that I'll be in a situation, and I've got somebody who's uh, demonized in front of me. They need deliverance. I brought deliverance to a lot of people. But I am much more comfortable in other areas of ministry than I am in that one. And so I've got somebody here who needs deliverance. I'm looking around for somebody who's got that anointing. And when I can't find them, I'm face to face with the fact that it's been left up to me. Some of you, when you're praying for somebody with cancer, you look for me. What does this verse say? 
The anointing qualifies you to do as the occasion demands. Sometimes the Lord will put the person with a special anointing and deliverance will move them from the room before you run into the demonized person because there has to be a confidence not in your gift but in the presence who is upon you who has everything necessary to succeed in the assignment that's before you. Do as the occasion demands. Now, I've got a question for you. Would you rather have the anointing of Saul or the anointing of David? <laughs> you want another option? <laughs> like C, all the above? <laughs> Honestly, we want to be like David, not like Saul. But the problem is, is our thinking still has a hard time acknowledging that Samuel took oil, the same prophet, the same oil, the same prophetic destiny was poured over two men. The outcome are worlds apart. The problem was not with the anointing. There was no deficiency in the prophetic destiny. To be given the privilege to be the commander over God's inheritance is one of the greatest privileges ever given to a human being in all of history. The problem was not with the anointing. It was with the person's response to what God had given. The anointing was the same. So here we are. We're in a wonderful season, the most glorious season we've ever had as a church. The things that we see happening the breakthroughs, the transformations, and I just celebrate to the max. But we're also in the most interest, interesting season because of the crises, the failures, the difficulty in the nation. Some of the things that are going on nationwide, in the church, in the kingdom, with revival, some of the things that are going on elsewhere, it's one of the most unusual seasons, and it's like the Lord is requir he's, he's saying, I've heard what you've asked for, but I've got to know if you can recognize the anointing even when it's released through vessels you wouldn't necessarily approve. Even when you find out later that the person was living in a secret sin and I still used him to release the word. Do we love the presence, the anointing, the move of God enough to be willing to appear to the critics as one with the one who has fallen? I believe it's the requirement of the Lord. I believe it is the evidence and the testimony of us embracing a lifestyle of grace. Amen. Let's stand. You guys doing okay? Amen. Yeah? Don't eat the bones. Maybe that should be the name of the message. Don't eat the bones. <laughs> there's a grace being released for this. Do you feel that? I hope you do. There's a, there's a grace. There's a grace being released, number one that another aspect of the fear of man would be just, just pruned right off. It's like the grapevine that just gets a branch pruned off, and we all need that kind of a pruning, and that's what the Word of the Lord does, is He's right now removing. Some of you are making adjustments in your thinking right now where some of that fear of man thing that, that you've not wanted to associate here, <laughs> some of you are here as the group you didn't want to associate with, and now you are one, so... <clears throat> You, you, you exercise great faith by coming here. But there's a grace for this. There's a grace the Lord right now, just through the Word, is literally giving an ability to maneuver through a minefield. It doesn't scare me. It excites me. But it keeps me connected to the only one who keeps me safe in that minefield. It's not scary 
when you go by his lead. Are you with me? When you go by his lead, there is something at the end of this process where the Lord is looking for a company of people that he can entrust with a greater glory. We don't get it through self-analyzation and self-discovery. We get it by recognizing the great one, the only one, King Jesus, and what he alone can do in our life. Put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for you. Father, I ask for that grace, that that I, I can feel being released into the room, into lives. I'm praying right now there would be an injection of hope, an injection of courage and faith in this regard. And that you would help us as a company of people to decipher what is meat and what is bones. To be able to discern things that you are doing in the earth, even though they, they, they happen in unusual and unexpected ways and through unusual tools and instruments. We just say, God, we want to live unoffended. We want to live without offense. We don't want to stand in the place with the accuser of the brethren and accuse fallen ones as though that would help them in their recovery. We want to stand in a place extending a hand even when it looks like we are one with one who has fallen in a way that would tarnish our own image and reputation. God, our cry is for more of you no matter what. That's it. We just are hungry for you and for what you have purposed to do on the earth. We declare that the kingdoms of this world belong to you. We declare that the government is increasing upon your shoulders. We declare that the glory of the Lord is filling the earth. We declare that you are taking us from glory to glory. We declare that you've made us the head and not the tail. You've made us the lender and not the borrower. You've called us to be a people, your own possession, your own personal inheritance. God, we celebrate being your inheritance. And I pray for a grace that would rest upon this body. It would just come with people who join us. It would just automatically come in their heart and mind to be able to decipher through this minefield of discerning what is meat and what is bones, discerning what's been released by God and what hasn't been released by God. I pray that there would be a protection against even fear, the kind of fear that is overwhelming, that, that, uh, that keeps us from taking risk. I say, Lord, increase the boldness, increase the courage, increase the passion in this house. Let us become even more so a people that live with risk because we want the more bad enough. I pray for that kind of a grace, a blanket to rest on this company of people that marks the remainder of our life, that marks the outcome of the impact of the kingdom on this city. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Paul, why don't you come on up?